guys, and welcome to another episode of Sustain This with Vivo Barefoot. This podcast is about cutting through all the bullshit and empowering people with courage and knowledge. And our goal is to make these conversations as super authentic and as real as possible. Our guest today is Dr. Peter Francis, a lecturer at the Institute of Technology, Carlo, and a longtime sports science and medicine consultant. He is a lover of pushing his own boundaries, both intellectually and physically, and a frequent visitor of the icy cold ocean swim, even during the coolest months of the Irish winter. He is also one of Vivo Barefoot's most influential academic researchers and contributors. If you have any questions for Peter after the episode, please get in touch with us at sustainthis at vivobarefoot.com or on any of our social platforms you can find by searching at Vivo Barefoot. So welcome, Peter. Thanks for joining us today. Good to be here. So you look like you're joining us from a, some kind of log cabin. Tell us a little bit about how you ended up there. Um, so I really fortunately decided to build um, a log cabin um, just before the global pandemic. Um, I envisaged it would be a bit of a creative space where I could come in and work and have meetings and think and um, do all that kind of thing. And um, it's turned into that, but uh, it's turned into that at a really good time when uh, people would would probably love to have a space like this. Um, so lucky me. Amazing. I love it. So one of the things you preach about, well, not preach, but you talk about a lot in your research and um, and communications is about natural movement, is about being in nature. So. Tell us a little bit about how important that is to your research. And one of the things that I want to understand from you is how that translates to what you call musculoskeletal function and physical literacy. Okay. Um, there's a lot in that, but let's start with maybe um, the musculoskeletal function and physical literacy. So I guess the idea would stem from the fact that we were always very active um, hunter gatherers for most of our evolutionary history. And then we sort of maintained that up to quite recently, even with farming 10,000 years ago, it still required us to intensively cooperate and to um, have high levels of physical activity. But then really recently in evolutionary terms, like last week, say, um, the Industrial Revolution began to change all of that um, and it began to make us more sedentary as we move towards factories, cars, schools and all these sorts of things. Um, and then, I mean, up a gear in, in evolutionary terms, the equivalent of an hour ago, technology was invented 20 years ago. So um, that's then added another layer of screen time and sedentary time. So we all know this, it's nothing new I'm saying here, that we have seen a dramatic reduction in our physical activity levels but something that's even more interesting is um, the reduction in the environmental complexity in other words we don't just move less we move less variably as well so um, when you think about physical literacy and the ability to jump to throw to catch to climb um, to play sport or even just to to, to go up a mountain like we did last year and jump in a lake. These require um, a body that's capable of navigating variable environments um, in all sorts of ways. So what's really interesting to me now is how does our modern lifestyles um, affect our musculoskeletal health? How does our modern environment, um, shall we say, not challenge it to the same extent and what is the consequence for us then if we want to lead a healthy active or even sporting um life um so that's kind of the the backdrop of where um i guess our environment and our musculoskeletal health interact that's really interesting so if you've done all of this research into your general musculoskeletal health and how that affects our lifestyles and various other things. Why feet? Like why, why barefoot? Why do you have such an interest in feet? 
Okay, well, the barefoot stuff came um, from, uh, for very selfish reasons, really. Uh, I was a passionate runner, and uh, but also a very injury-prone runner. And I was, was after my first degree, I was in the, in the Middle East teaching English. Sorry for anybody that's heard this story a million times, but anyway, um, it is the start of it, so I'll start there. Um, I was in the Middle East, and I couldn't get access to physio for my plantar fasciitis. And I got a, a, a kind of a magazine article from a friend at home, and he said, have you heard about uh, barefoot running um, for injuries and so on? And I thought, oh, well, you know, I've got nothing to lose. So I had a, a 92 Jeep Cherokee, an old uh, Jeep, and I, I remember driving to the only grass park in the whole country. So in a land of complete and utter sand, um, I drove to the only grass park. It would be a park that uh, I think you would hate, Emma, because they put about a million litres of water down onto this park every day just to keep the grass um, going. But anyway, I went there and I ran. And uh, after 15 minutes of barefoot running on grass, a condition that had previously taken months and months and loads of money and um, treatment um, started to subside. And after two runs, it was basically gone. And I came back um, to Ireland to start my PhD. And I came into my professor and I was like, look, I know we're going to do this stuff on um, age-related changes in muscle quality and all of this, but this happened to me in the Middle East and we need to do a study on this. And my professor was a real skeptic and he was like, oh, you know, kind of, I'll humor this guy. But he, he did. He, 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 he let me mentor one of his undergrad students to do a project. And we saw that runners ran differently without their shoes um, compared to with them. And that was the beginning of the whole of the whole thing. Now, then you say, well, why feed and that? And so the next question, once I knew that things runners behaved differently um, without their shoes, then the why becomes very interesting. So, I mean, really, in broad terms, the why is um, think of it like um, a computer and you're trying to type up a, a document. If, if, if you put a pair of flip flops on your hand and start slapping the keyboard, it's going to take you a long time to get a, a really nice, well written uh, document because the computer can only produce according to the quality of the input. So if you think about your feet in a similar way, if the input to your feet is not so good, the computer, i.e. the brain, it can't control um, your movement strategies uh, quite as well. Okay, And that becomes then a, a kind of a, a cycle between poor movement, uh, poor information in, um, poor movement out, um, and then we, we, we can get various different injuries. So you kind of vaguely alluded to the fact that the feet are connected to much more in our body and our general health than perhaps people understand. So what what is that connection? I mean, have you done any research on the connection to cognitive behavior or perhaps the circulatory system or chronic illnesses or anything like that? I haven't done research um, directly. Um, but what I what I will say is <clears throat> there's some really interesting stuff coming out in the area of what they call earthing, um, which looks at the benefits of being barefoot on natural surfaces for chronic inflammation. Um, now, it's worth bearing in mind that all all diseases are a form of inflammation um, and most mismatched diseases like obesity, diabetes, um, all these types of things um, are inflammatory in nature. So there are anti-inflammatory ways of living your life and there are inflammatory ways of living your life. So um, anti-inflammatory ways would be yoga, mindfulness, being barefoot, uh, cold water swimming, um, intermittent fasting. In other words, anything that's where we're not stressing the body. Uh, inflammatory ways of living would be being in a rush, uh, being disconnected from the ground, uh, eating lots of sugar, um, all of these sorts of things that are associated with our modern environments. Um, you mentioned then about like the circulatory system and the brain and so on. Um, 
Well, of course, it's all linked because um, something I'm kind of talking to my students a lot about lately is in the medical world, there's a tendency to say, right, let's look at your knee. Let's look at the pain in your knee. Let's deconstruct your knee and see, can we rebuild your knee? You know, and it's like, it doesn't work like that because your knee still needs your brain. Your knee is still influenced by your foot and your ankle and your hip and everything else. So um, the organism is is one. So when when one thing uh, changes, so does everything else. That's really interesting. You mentioned something just there about stress. And you were talking about how there's this... I mean, would you mind explaining what you mean by mismatch? Um, because I, I'm interested how that then correlates to good and bad stress. Yeah, so really broadly, a mismatch disease is diseases that are more prevalent due to changes in the environment. So in other words, if we and our genetics are largely the same, how do we perform in one environment versus another? So um, if you think about our hunter-gatherer uh, past, you would say we are used to periods of low food availability, high food availability, uh, high temperature, low temperature, um, lots of movement, no movement, um, all of the kind of spectrum um, of environmental stresses and they vary and then we vary with them and so um, <clears throat> we have all of these physiological functions like hunger like the ability to shiver like the hair standing up on your skin because we're designed to be um, in flux with our environment in that way so um, when we um, change that so for example we go to completely temperature controlled environment um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, a constant supply of energy, um, no movement, um, all of these sorts of things. Now we start to live in very um, constant environments versus very variable environments. And that means we're not using the spectrum of our physiology in the way that we, we once did. And that can lead to certain mismatched diseases. So for example, you could say that people who have obesity or who are very overweight, you could actually call them very high functioning, very high performing um, mm. people because it means that their uh, evolutionary history, their evolutionary genetics are functioning extremely well, um, but they are in an environment that doesn't help them in, in that respect. So um, yeah, mismatched diseases occur basically when our environment um, changes in a way that our body hasn't had time to catch up with. So is vaguely what you're, well, more specifically what you're saying there in terms of feet, is that actually our feet should be going through that stress that we would have been put in in the environment and actually that's good for us. And so if you think of it in terms of being a spring, I guess, that that resilience going through our feet is actually necessary for our own health? Is, is that kind of what you're saying? Um, yeah, I mean, resilience is, uh, is provoked through uh, beneficial stress, um, failure. Um, so, you know, you, you think about it, you go to the gym, you stress a muscle, it gets uh, bigger, stronger um the benefit of that is that you can um use it to do more things um but there's other benefits too in terms of uh, muscle acts as a huge sink for um uh, glucose so um your ability to digest your food is better and therefore you're under less metabolic stress so if we take that concept to the foot and we've got 26 bones and tons of little muscles um that are designed to uh, be able to navigate various terrain and we then say okay what we're going to do is we're going to make the terrain really flat we're going to make the interior of your shoe really flat um, and then we're going to put a lot of cushion and padding it's a bit like you know we're going to sit you on the couch and see what happens to your muscles 
you know, mm-hmm. um, versus we're going to bring you to the gym and see what happens. Um, that might be a way of thinking about it. It's really interesting. So you've described a little bit about what the short term effects are that you found in wearing in, well, in going barefoot, transitioning back to that natural resilience state. But what about the long term effects in, in, yeah. in your different bits of research? How do you find the long term effects are on both kids and adults? Okay, well, this this is why um, this field of research is an interesting one to be in at the moment. Um, the long-term effects of anything require um, longitudinal follow-up studies, um, which are very expensive. So um, both in terms of uh, time, money, resources, what you need to be able to do in a perfect world is uh, get a bunch of people and track them for a long time. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then you will see true changes um, that you can say. However, because that's not always possible, we do things in exercise science that are, you know, 6, 12 and 24 weeks. And we look for changes in in muscles which are measurable in those time frames to give us an indication of what might happen. Um, So uh, more commonly, longitudinal studies do happen, but... uh, not not as not as common as as we would like in an ideal world um and you know if you take the foot muscle stuff for it as an example the changes in foot muscle size and strength are massive um just by by transitioning from um, cushion footwear to uh, minimalist more barefoot type footwear and moving around um, in fact they're equivalent to a strength training um program for the foot so uh, that would be an example of a short intervention. What we're working on at the moment, um, and and Vivo Barefoot have have sponsored Maisie's PhD to do this, is we are looking at um, different footwear habits of different children in different countries, and then we are going to try and measure musculoskeletal differences between those. So um, that's called a cross-sectional study. Now, what that allows you to do is take snapshots of different groups and see how they might be different. It doesn't let you necessarily say they're different because, because let's say, for example, um, you've got in one country, they're really physically active and in another one, they're not. Then you can't, you can't always tease out whether it was the footwear or not, but it does give you a good indicator, a good snapshot um, of what potential differences in musculoskeletal function might be. We have applied for funding at the moment to try and take that research on then a step further, which will be if there's musculoskeletal differences in children uh, who do wear footwear versus who don't or who are minimalist footwear, the next thing to see will be how does this affect their movement skills? I mean, the holy grail would be how does it affect their movement skills and how does it affect their future risk of injury later on? You know, that's the kind of the kind of what do they call it? The North Star that you're all you're mm-hmm. trying to work towards to try and understand a bit a bit better. So um, that will be interesting. Another thing that would also be interesting is children are so important in this because, you know, they're the. They're the next generation and they're the ones that have a chance still, you know what I mean? Me and you, Emma, we've got, you know, we can do a bit better, but there's, there's a lot of sins uh, of the past for me and you. But um, with children, a bit, a bit like the reason for doing anything in relation to climate change and so on, it's because they're going to be be here. So making things a bit better for them seems like a good idea. So another thing we'd like to do is uh, get children barefoot um, and in minimalist footwear and do some exercise interventions to see how do they change from um, their kind of normal shod shod lives as well. That's super interesting. I've got lots of questions off the back of that, but I'm super keen to understand from you this restriction on research that you mentioned around how expensive it is to do long-term research, how difficult it is. Do you think that that's one of the reasons that people would still argue that things like earthing or even barefoot are a bit of a pseudoscience? Um, yeah, look, I think 
um, the quality of the science and the quality of the information does impact what you can what you can say in terms of what you've observed. Um, mm. So, you know, potentially that is a that is a limitation because you can you can always criticize um, research. But you know, I, I don't want to paint uh, doom and gloom. We're we're working on this stuff. It's 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 um, it's just going to take a bit longer. Yeah, I mean, the reason I ask is because there's just so many anecdotal stories about how people have changed their lifestyles or or brought their children up in these different ways that you're speaking about, um, and and therefore that correlating into you know, improved health in many different ways. And I myself got a message from someone yesterday that insists that they just feel calmer in Vivo barefoot shoes or minimalist shoes or barefoot. Um, so I wonder like when you're thinking about something like cognitive behaviors, how, how do you, if you can't prove that, where's the balance between things being anecdotal and you feeling it yourself versus being able to prove it by science? Oh, uh, well, the, if you take the reason why somebody feels anything, uh, that's quite a complicated research question in itself. So, um, you know, in the, in the therapy uh, profession, for example, if I'm nice to you and you're in chronic pain, you will feel, um, better, even if I'm the worst clinician in the world. Um, so 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 that's your your first change to um the placebo effect is is a powerful effect um that that creates measurable change so if you think you're getting something beneficial that will work you will also feel better um and then there's like you know other real physical changes that are happening such as if you do exercise you will tend to um feel better and have stronger muscles. So trying to unpick all of that as to why somebody feels the way they do um, can often be uh, tricky. Um, what was the second part of your question? Just wondering where the, the balance was between anecdotal stories about how people feel and, and science, scientific rigor. And you seem to be measuring it really well by not making any absolute claims. So you, you kind of answered the question just in how you responded. <laughs> Okay, good, good. Done. <laughs> so talk to me about um, some of the more specific uh, outcomes of, of some of the research you've done. I, I mean, I want to ask you about autism because I know it's something that you've looked at before. So how, how have you connected being barefoot, um, you know, having more natural movement with things like disabilities like autism? Um, well, firstly, um, uh, I haven't yet, uh, done that research, but, um, it is something we're interested in at Carlo because, um, my colleague, uh, Sharon Kinsler is, um, a specialist in autism research and, um, we are also aware from, um, reports that Vivo Barefoot have given us, uh, from the shop that parents are suggesting. Um, with certain uh, children with certain types of autism have an easier time wearing less restrictive shoes and are less likely to throw them off and um, all of that. So that then, of course, perks our interest because as people who have an interest in the human body and physiology, we're thinking, what is different in terms of the sensory input um, that means that maybe these kids might um, have an easier time in minimalist footwear. So we we have done a case study that was due to go to conference before the pandemic, so it hasn't yet, where we looked at certain movement skills in a child with autism in um, three different types of footwear and barefoot. Um, we have also begun to survey some parents about their experience with footwear because the first thing you do in research is try and define the problem really well so that you know um, what, what to look at. Um, so 
we've started to do that a little bit. And again, another project that we're applying for funding for will be to try and upscale that research and um, learn more about it. But it's definitely something that's really interesting. And it's definitely just from a kind of conceptual logic uh, perspective, uh, well uh, worth investigating because if uh, autism has uh, sensory aspects to the disorder, then by default, just as we spoke about with flip-flops on your hand or shoes on your feet, um, there's potential that there's a better way for those guys to, to, to move. So yeah, we're really interested in that. That's really exciting. And uh, do you find that, you know, that, that socioeconomic factors have any kind of, um, I guess you talk about ne needing to know the problem really well. So do you find that where there's differences in say, ethnicity or wealth and class, is that is that correlating to any of the findings you're having on physical health? Um, I think the first thing to say there is uh, wealth, class, ethnicity um, will have a huge impact on health, and it does. Um, I was listening to a really interesting interview with um, with somebody from the from the legal profession, and um, I can't remember that the, the sentence just summed it up really well. But he was like. Um, He's like, if you want to solve crime, solve poverty, you know, um, if so, I think um, you will have more uh, obesity, you'll have uh, lower uh, education levels, you'll have uh, across the board. Yeah, I think that's going to have a huge impact. And we know that. Um, now, what I'm trying to include in some of our research at the moment with Maisie, for example, where she looks at um, footwear behaviors in um, children in different countries. We are trying to account for where those samples come from. So what socioeconomic areas those samples come from. One of the things that was really interesting about the study I did in New Zealand was um, we, we could see that the school I investigated was from an affluent area in Auckland and that made it really interesting because half of the boys wanted to be barefoot regardless so what that what that told us I guess or at least made us curious about was up to that point if you there was a study for example comparing Germany and South Africa and all the kids um, in South Africa were more or less barefoot and all the kids in Germany were more or less shod and there's some assumptions there that, OK, there's a climate difference and there's an economic difference. And that's the end of the story. But what was really interesting in New Zealand was um, the, the, the economics of New Zealand and Auckland and that particular area was more or less equivalent to or close to what Germany would be. But the mm -hmm. culture and the lifestyle and the behavior um, was still different. So I think accounting for those things really is important to give us more insight um, as to who's affected by, by what most often. But if I was to speculate in terms of um, uh, whether whether socioeconomic status um, and whether ethnicities predominant in certain socioeconomic gr groups are affected more by adverse health outcomes, I can tell you absolutely yes. Super interesting. So we managed to cover a lot of ground <laughs> um, and I wanted to ask the question around whether or not you felt like it's, do you feel frustrated that this is still something you have to keep saying over and over again and that we have to research? I mean, it's a very, very complicated topic when I listen to you speak about all these things, but actually it's a very simple message around mismatch and around healthier lifestyles. So, you know, why, why? Why don't people get it yet? Like, why isn't it more ubiquitous in our society then, your message? Um, I don't get frustrated at all um, because I love doing this stuff. Um, and I'm a curious person and I like to understand 
why the world around me is the way it is and um, I enjoy finding out pieces of information that help me in my life and then when I feel like I have a decent grasp over a concept then I love to share it which is why I write a blog or come on and chat with you um, so you know you have to remember that as well that you know science is is sort of a an incremental uh, acquisition of understanding um, it's based on observing things but it doesn't mean that um, the world changes because of it um, because if it did let's be honest we'd already be on top of climate change so um, uh, that's probably the most glaring and obvious reason why uh, you know and, and even just other things like you know we we've shut down the entire world um, for um, a pandemic but we let the pandemics of mismatched diseases and um, obesity and diabetes run rampant through our societies and we create environments whereby um, we fuel those epidemics rather than um, reduce them so I don't even I don't I, I try not to even go there it's so <laughs> crazy you know no I know it's something we spoke about before when we were climbing that mountain last year around protecting and, and nurturing our own mental health in in this world because otherwise we we can't be of service to it which I think is still more relevant than ever so maybe what you could leave us on is is your top three tips for living a more barefoot lifestyle. What, what's your big three? Okay, so um, for these things, I like to try and uh, kind of come at them from what I practice myself at the moment. So I'll, I'll kind of go with that. So uh, in the morning, when I come out of the house and I come down to this log cabin, um, I'm always barefoot. And um, this is actually the first year that I did it completely through the winter as well. And you know what's brilliant that I discovered as a really cool side effect is your shoes don't get dirty. So good. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really handy in, in the winter time. So, um, so it's brilliant. I, all my shoes, they're spotless. And... Um, you know, I'm in touch with the ground. It's just so good. But uh, yeah, so then, you know, um, but but a serious note is I suppose that um, it's all about senses. So the trouble for us nowadays is we're living in our head, right? And we're totally using the kind of prefrontal cortex when the, the sort of part of our brain that's around a lot longer um, is to do with our senses. And our senses actually serve us really well. Um, and they have done for millions of years. So when you when I'm barefoot, I'm getting that sort of initial sensory input. So then I might meditate. And after I, you know, when I'm meditating, again, I'm, I'm going within, into my body, sort of away from my head, um, towards the senses again. I try, and I'm speaking to you now, for example, at a standing desk on a wooden floor while barefoot, right? So I try where possible to, to give my body a chance in that sense. Um, I've had a run this morning, um, barefoot on a cross country course, so lovely variable grass terrain. Um, I realize not everybody has that, but fortunately in Ireland, um, wet grass is not, not a problem. So, um, later on today, I will jump in those, uh, icy waters that you spoke about. Um, and really what all those things have in common, of course, is, is sensation. Um, and even if I have a really busy day and I'm thinking, oh, God, uh, how did that interview go with Emma? And, oh, no, I, could, I should have said this and I should have said that and blah, blah, blah. When I jump in the ocean, that's all gone, you know, because you're just totally in your body and you're in your senses again. So I think the big challenge um, facing everybody now is um, the, the getting out of their head. And what they have to remember is you are the information in your environment. So if you can tune out of the information, i.e. the news and all of that stuff, and tune into your senses, you realize that the information is a lot worse than the situation. That's really beautiful. 
I really like that. I always feel like I've met my guru when I meet you. <laughs> One. Oh, stop. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I've already taken so much of your time. So I really appreciate you joining us. And I'm very envious of your swim. I, as you know, am stuck in quarantine in a prison like facility in Northern Territory. So I'm very, very jealous of you getting out in the ocean. And um, I hope you have a great time. And we'll see you again soon for some more podcasts where you're going to be joining me to co host, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe. I don't know whether I, I'd be I'd be in, intimidated by your podcast hosting abilities. But, uh, you know, chin up now. You've only got 11 days to freedom. We're all still locked down here in Ireland. So do your, do your time and then you're free. Counting down. Thanks very much for joining us, Peter. Thanks. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Sustain This with Vivo Barefoot. Peter will be back with us for more soon, so please let us know if you want to hear anything from him at sustainthis at vivobarefoot.com. And remember, if you enjoyed today's episode, please do give us a review so we can keep it all going. See you later.